John Galassi is the uh, president and publisher of FSG, Publishing House, but more importantly, he's a poet. Welcome to the Bibliophile. Thank you very much. I'd like to start with a quote from Sir Stanley Unwin from his uh, The Truth About Publishing, if I could. If it is not a profession, it is, as Mr. Raymond Mortimer aptly said, at once an art, a craft, and a business, for which a curious and unusual combination of qualifications is desirable. There is, of course, the literary background, the knowledge of the literature of the subject with which the publisher is dealing, and equally important, where to turn for that knowledge. But something much more than knowledge is needed, namely judgment, and what, for want of a better word, I can only call flair in the selection of the manuscripts to be published. Then there is the technical knowledge of paper, printing, binding, block making, etc., connected with the physical production of books, a knowledge of which needs to be associated with taste, But if the publisher is to do justice to the books he has selected and produced, he must finally be able to market them, not merely at home, but throughout the world. I'm getting to the question. We may not uh, any longer have to guess so much in terms of the number of first runs of books, and maybe the risk isn't quite so high as what it used to be because of Uh, print on demand and such, but editorial risk taking is uh, always there. Publishing is about taste and the telling, as you've said, and to convey enthusiasm. So what gets you enthusiastic? I think it's the uh, uh, voice that is convincing, that's uh, exciting, that's uh, moving or artful. Uh, could be any combination of those things, but it's it's the that I believe this whoever's writing this thing it, it it's it's grabbed my attention uh, it's it makes me keep going it's it makes me curious it, it gives me a desire to get more and that doesn't happen very often no. Um, Does that have to happen in the first chapter or not? I think it has to happen in the first paragraph. I really do. Because it's a voice. It's not, the, it's not the rational, it's the irrational part of it that, that grabs you, I think. So if you don't believe the voice right away, it's, it's over. Can you explain the irrational? <laughs> uh, well, uh, no, I can't explain it, but I, all I can... You can't sit and... I mean, there are certain kind of books where you can sit and calculate how many people will read this. And and, um, and there are certain books that are necessities, you know, that people need to know how to drive a car or some manual or something like that. But what, I, what we're talking about here is more imaginative writing, I think. And um, it's, it's not something that you can parse. I, I do think that... What in my experience in my career uh, as a publisher, working with editors and being an editor myself, you know, either the editor has it or or she doesn't. You know, it's this it's, ability to yes, this, discern this, what's yes, exciting. Yeah, and this this capacity to be blown away by so to to hear. Let's put it that way. This capacity to intuit the integrity and originality of the voice. Yeah. And where does that come from? Reading, just reading a lot and and on top, uh, you know, but beneath the reading is some ineffable openness to, it's openness and judgment, I and mean, it's sort of Stanley Unwin sort of said that. It's, yeah. it's a combination of aesthetic response and shrewdness, you know, about maybe you, you have to begin with the aesthetic response, but eventually shrewdness has to kick in as whether you can do something with this. Not, I mean, a publisher has a fairly narrow range of what he or she can publish uh, effectively. You mean making a profit or breaking Or even? just what they're good at, you know. Right. And so I think that uh, there are lots of really good books that come through our offices and we just think they're good, but they're not right for us. 
because because we have a particular angle on on the market. And what is that? Well, in our case, it's literary a certain kind of literary publishing. And uh, another publisher was, is really really good at politics, for instance. Uh, we we publish political books, and some of them are great too. But we we do some other things that are more fundamental to our sense of ourselves. What does that mean? In other words, you know, I think that we think of ourselves as a literary publishing house, okay. and so. But you published Tom Friedman, for example. Yes, yeah. I've, I've published all his books. I love yeah. Tom. We've had a great working relationship for almost thirty years, you know. But it's because starting out, you heard the trust trust factor in his voice. I think he used to say, "Good journalism is." Good reporting and good analysis. Great journalism is great reporting and great analysis. And that, there it is. That's that's the same thing in a different key in a different kind of writing. But I I was um, convinced right away by by Tom's voice again. So that voice. How much of it has to do with the confidence of the author, and how much of it has to do with the the confidence of the writing? Well, I think it starts with the confidence of the author. The author is in touch with something in herself that is genuine, and that connection, uh, if it lasts, is the basis for a style. You know, and style is what it's all about. Really, what was the second part of your question? I mean, Can't remember. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you said how much of it is? Oh, is uh, is the. Uh the writer, and I know that you publish writers, not books. Right, we try to we try to do that. Yeah, right? we st- try to stick with people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, but with Wileys in the world these days, it's not quite as easy, I guess. I mean, acquiring books is much more. It feels much more complicated than it was. I mean, when I was young, I'm sure I thought it was very difficult then too, but the stakes are different now. So, because the market is shrinking, so there's more competition among the surviving players for books that they think will go the distance, and so they're willing. Some someone is always willing to overpay for a book, you know, and so you really have to be very careful about that, not get not get overrun by enthusiasm, you know. That's that's the that's the shrewdness factor, the Stanley Unwin factor. It's not just love. Yeah, yeah. It's marriage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's lamentable that so much money is being poured into, for example, TV celebrities who produce books, and then it takes away money from from books that may not sell quite as well, but should be out there. And it's also true that first books. People will pay overpay for them because they're uh, they think they have a bead on something, on someone that's uh, going to be long term, right? Yeah. yeah. People, you know, readers are not as loyal as they used to be. They read books that they hear about. They don't read the author the way. Mm. So it makes being loyal to the author more complicated. I know too. For example, with Faber and Faber, I like it's, whenever I see a Faber book, I really, I, I just have to say, okay, I know it's already gone through a, a really good editorial scan, and they're, they're, uh, I want to buy, I want to read those books. They're very close um, colleagues of ours. We've published a lot of books in common with them. And that's was my next question. What's the relationship between you two? How far does it go back, and why have you got it? Well, it goes back to probably the 50s when Bob Cheru, who had been uh, at Harcourt Brace and published a lot of great British writers, including Eliot and so when he came to FSG and uh, eventually a lot of those authors came here and the relationships that he had had with, with people at Faber, you know, were transferred here. And Elliot, Elliot went with him. Yeah, yeah. we published Elliot's last books, which are very, which are minor things. They're not as, although we're publish, we're going to be publishing 
new, uh, new editions of him here, which I'm very excited about. Um, new introductions? We, yes, new uh, new edition of his poetry, edited by Chris, Christopher Ricks, and we're going to be publishing his et- collected essays, and and so it, partly an homage to that early relationship. So especially in poetry, there was a, a huge overlap. They published Robert Lowell, they published uh, a lot of our authors that we publish, uh, Philip Larkin, Ted Hughes, Seamus Heaney, Derek Walcott, these are people that we converge on. Tom yeah. Gunn, uh, there's a whole central core of mid-century poetry that was shared by Faber. And we've shared other authors too, like William Golding. Christopher Ricks is a big uh, Dylan fan. Yes, he wrote that book that maybe that's what got him the Nobel Prize, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I've just been reading, I'm thinking of Dylan, as I'm just reading about how Tulsa has got all his papers there now. Yes, I met the guy the other night who's, who's running the, uh, he's going to do a, a study center there. Right. It puts Tulsa on the map, doesn't mm-hmm. it? No, it's Oklahoma City. It's not Tulsa. I, I think. think it's Tulsa. It's, in any way, People it's Oklahoma, can Google. right? Let's agree on that. <laughs> it's what? It's Oklahoma. It's Oklahoma, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Yeah, speaking of Faber, Mitzi a- Angel right. is taking over from she, you. Well, she's, uh, she's coming to work with me. Okay. Yes, she's not, she's not you're, taking you're, She's answering to you. Yes, yeah. She'll, you're working uh, with Mellon? I hired her 10 years ago to come work and run our Faber Inc. imprint because we had a sh- joint imprint with them at that point. We undid that imprint, but Mitzi stayed. She was a very beloved person here. Then she went over there to, to be the publisher of Faber. But now we've hired her back and she's gonna be the publisher of FSG reporting to me. Okay. So, yeah, but I'm still here. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> okay. That's but, funny because I just had the sense that you were, le- you were leaving and then no, I read a no, bit more, but you're no, not. No, good, no, not good. at all. But I love Mitzi and I'm looking forward to working with her on the future, you know. Mm-hmm. Someday I will leave. <laughs> I will, someday I will leave the building, as they say. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You went to Harvard College and studied under Robert Lowell mm-hmm. and Elizabeth Bishop. Mm-hmm. What was she like? She was my favorite teacher ever. And uh, she was also an FSG author, though she wasn't published by Faber. They were sexist, I guess. She didn't like teaching. She was rather reserved, and but she was incredibly interesting and definite about what she thought about things, and I became very fond of her. So, so what was she definite that, about? That's her table right there. Oh, is it? Yeah. Great. I'll take a photograph yeah. of that, if you don't mind. And this is a painting that was in her house, actually. Not, I don't know who it's by, but oh. anyway. So she, really, you, you really were connected to her? Yes, yeah, I was. Like, were you a star student? Or? I was one of her favorite students, I, I would say. I mean, she says that, and yeah. so I'm not boasting. To say <laughs> that. So. But tell me a bit more about her as a person. I mean, she was sort of like a grandmother figure to me. She was a New England lady. You know, she had rather reserved manners. She did remind me of my grandmother. And so, I mean, of course, she was a, a lesbian and a serious alcoholic too yeah you know yeah but uh she and she was a great writer she she was very you know she was best friends with robert lowell for that's why she was at harvard actually because he had gone back to england he had gone to england to um take up with caroline blackwood and so uh, elizabeth was taking his was a substituting for him hmm. So, but what about she, her, her personality? Does she, about? Well, she was funny. She was uh, very witty and um, kind. She was a great cook. And what drove her? Oh, I think what drove her, not that this, these are things I learned later, but she was incredibly lonely. Her, her, you probably read about her, you know the story of her mother. Uh, was declared insane when she was yeah. small. Her father had died and her mother went insane. So I think what drove her was that deep, deep loneliness, probably. And, and br- she was a very, very brilliant um, p- 
poet. Did she have a partner? She partner? yes. In fact, her she had a series of partners, but the last one she met right when I was her student. He, she was a secretary in Kirkland House, one of the dorms at Harvard, and that's and that was Alice Methvessel, who was her, her last pa partner and inherited her estate and all that. So we're probably going to publish the letters between them. Oh, actually, okay. Actually, yeah, yeah. So you uh, you got an internship at, at uh, Houghton Mifflin, uh, Houghton Mifflin, Houghton. 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 I always mix. I know Houghton. I Houghton, remember Houghton. Houghton. they all <laughs> said it differently. Yeah. I mean, there were so many ways of mispronouncing it. it was, there were, we had a list of them. Yeah. <laughs> Muffin Company was. Right. <laughs> yes, I started out working there. Yeah. Um, I, I was from Massachusetts, so I, after college, I uh, I won a fellowship and I went to England for a couple of years. At and Cambridge. I, yeah, yeah, and then I came back, found this job there, and I worked there for a couple of years, and they sent me down here to their office in New York, and that was what I wanted anyway. So then you went yeah. to Random House and you got fired? Yes. You know, you know your story, you hey. know your stuff. Yes. Yeah, and uh, it's because you didn't have books with commercial potential. That's why, uh, this is what the guy said. Right, I didn't, I, I mean, I think a more accurate thing to say was that I didn't know how to work the system at Random House. And I didn't, I didn't particularly want to do it their way. I, I sort of wanted to do it my way, which was probably a little bit arrogant of me. What was your way and what was their way? Well, I just I wanted to find new writers and and um, they had they were a big successful machine and they wanted someone to give them more success. I think so. I, I it's partly my fault. It's partly their fault. Anyway, they fired me. I got a job here, which was the best thing that ever happened to me. Which is often true of being fired, by the way. Yeah. And um, the minute I got here, we started publishing very successful books. So they weren't right about that. I mean, the first really big book I signed up was called Presumed Innocent by Scott Turow, which yeah. tur turned out to be a number one bestseller and a huge phenomenon. And, you know, so that was really fun. It was having my revenge. You know? <laughs> Isn't it always nice when you leave a company and things kind of spiral down for them or spiral well, they, up for you? They, they, it spiraled up for me. They, yeah. were, they were fine. But yeah, I, yeah. You know, um, <laughs> but I loved being at FSG. After all, when I'd be a student of Lowell and Bishop and all, they were published by FSG. And, and yeah, so I, yeah. I revered, you know, it had an aura that was very... Uh, magical to me and so I I felt a great sense of convergence you know that I was working for this great little company well and that's uh, that's happened over the years too there are authors who you may not have been able to pay a huge advance to them but they really want to be published by this wonderful um, yes that has been a great advantage for us yeah. I think it's somewhat less so now because Money has yeah. invaded everything yeah. in a way. You know, when I signed up Jonathan Franzen for $20,000 in 1987 or whatever it was, right after I got here again, that was, I remember saying to him when we had lunch the first time, you have everything it takes to be a great writer. He was 28 years old, you know, he was... That's what I was wanting to do, you see. Find you love people. working with young... Yes, I loved... The, I mean, another one we published around the time was The Virgin Suicides by Jeff Eugenides, which was an incredible first novel. You know, it's, I just loved that. that another was, book that you loved was The Dog Soldiers. <laughs> yes, but I didn't get to publish that one. That right. was already under contract at Houghton Mifflin. Yeah. And I, I remember reading, I was asked to read the manuscript, which was I thought was an incredible privilege. And I think, I, I thought it was the most beautifully typed manuscript oh, I ever did. <laughs> and I thought, wow, this is publishing. This is, you know, you get to sit here and read this pristine, incredibly exciting book. And of course, it was years before I got to read anything as good as that again. But it, it certainly had me hooked. 
You're also a, a, a translator of Italian poetry of uh, Montale and uh, uh, Leopardi. Can you boil down what you got from Leopardi? Well, I decided to do the Leopardi project because I had finished Montale uh, or his major work and I really wanted to keep going doing translation and I I'm, I am working on his later work now but it's less interesting so I I decided I would try to go backward do that because I didn't see any contemporary of him that interested me as much yeah so Leopardi was the greatest 19th century poet and I thought oh it's it's 21 poems it can't be that but it was a huge project and very very difficult and so but it was a, you know a challenge and uh, what, what I, did you learn oh can you can you summarize it easily no i couldn't summarize it easily i mean i mean i learned a huge amount about the 19th century i learned about his own psyche and his um his relationship to the past and the, the way he used his own feelings and in philosophy together to create these sort of his poems are kind of they're both archaic and timeless and modern at the same time but he, he's a a really pivotal figure. He's someone, he's at the background of so much of Italian culture. His kind of pessimism and his uh, sense of pathos and uh, I mean he's he's there in so much of what other Italians have written. So, so I learned some of all that. I, it was no piece of cake. It was a very, very difficult job. Someone but I'm said, so glad I did it. I was yeah. going to say, someone said, I don't know who it was, that if it isn't difficult, it's not worth doing. Yeah, yeah. But, mo yeah, but most things you want to do are difficult in one way or another. So. Yeah. How do you spend your day, like, hour to hour? What exactly do you do? Well, this morning I'm talking to you. <laughs> uh, I'm going to... Uh, work on a manuscript that I'm editing of Robert Lowell's prose writings, actually, which, you know, I, I'm going to... Um, what do you mean work on it? You're going to edit well, it? I'm editing it, yeah. yeah. I'm going to uh, deal with uh, some projects that I'm, you know, negotiating with various people for. I'm having lunch with a, with a, a writer. I'm doing my expense account. Then uh, later this afternoon, I'm going to go to the New York Public Library and meet Mario Vargas Llosa. Oh, uh, yes. He's speaking given, today? Right. Yeah. So uh, he he's getting a special tour of the library, and I'm going to go with him. You publish him? Yes. Of course. We've published yeah. him for years. He's one of my favorite authors, actually, mm, as, wow. a, as a person, as a writer, but also as a man. I'm very fond of him. So pretty lousy little life you're leading. <laughs> it's and then I have to have dinner with some other writers. <laughs> so, you know, I won't get home till like ten or eleven. Right. A long, those are they're long days sometimes. Yeah. Okay. You wanted to know. I did. Thank you for telling me. Now I want to be a publisher. <laughs> the way I see a publisher, you have to manage a big company or a company. How does that jive? with you being an editor. Well, that's, you don't have any managerial experience. So why do, you, why do all these editors-in-chief become publishers or who are administrators? Well, that's a really good question. I mean, I think that in, this, in the case of FSG, which is a small boutique company, it was, you know, until the mid-90s, it was an independent company run by Roger Strauss, who started it. And I worked with him for a, a long time. Uh, and so I, I learned, when I came to FSG, it was still an independent, it was a struggling little company. Yeah. But let's see, I came in 86 and in 94 he sold it. Mm -hmm. So it was getting toward the end of the, it was getting to the, toward the end of viability for a small company to, to be able to buy the books, basically. Yeah. Well, That's what put them out of business, is all these big yeah, conglomerates yeah, con being able to outbid them. Yes, it, it was a, con a conglomeration is what made us go under the umbrella of Holtzbrink. 
because what we would do in those days is we didn't publish the paperbacks of the books. We would sell the paperback rights and we would sort of live off our half of that money. That well, was how we, how we kept going. Oh, uh, I was going to say, I think FSG basically, they didn't make a lot of money, they just survived. Absolutely. We, we never made a profit, I think, in those days. The profit came when he sold the company and he got a, a you know, good price for it. Yeah, you know, we've been profitable since we were reorganized under the, uh, in a modest way. But um, I've forgotten what we were talking about. Anyway. I think we're talking, I think we're talking about, well, I want to talk about the beginning of the company in 1945 when Roger Strauss set it up. Can you, can you talk a little bit about him? Sure. I mean, you've got Hot House there, so actually, Hot House is quite good about the foundation of the. That's book. my favorite part of the book. Yeah. I haven't I haven't got to those. Though. I haven't yeah. got to you yet. That's good because I, I don't like that part. I know, <laughs> but the first part is fun. It's it's really yeah. Fun. It's sort of yeah. Mad Men. Yeah. You know, Roger was a, a scion of a, a wealthy family who had been in the war doing PR. That's where he met Bob Giroux, actually, in the Navy. Yeah. And he came out and he wanted to do something. And You should say he comes from, like, the, the American uh, aristocracy. Yeah, he's from the old R crowd Jewish aristocracy. His mother was a Guggenheim, and his father was uh, from the Strauss family family that owned Macy's and stuff. He wasn't all that rich. People think he was richer than he was, but he had the manners and the experience of a rich person and the attitudes. Yeah, I suppose the know, confidence and the, the confidence and, and the connections. The, yeah, the connections and um, he was sort of a little bit of a con man too. In yes, the sense yes. that, you know, And quite the ladies man to put yes, it genteelly. Uh, yes, he was genteely. a big ladies man. He was not an intellectual, but he was a very, very shrewd and adventurous person. You know, in, in that sense, he reminds me a lot of Alan Lane, because Alan Lane didn't do a lot of reading. But really, is he, that right? Yeah, I don't he, know much about Alan Lane. He except had, that he's the one who invented Penguin. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd like to read about him. Roger was what he, what his son, who's a good friend of mine still, said that he was an opportunist. You know, and he started as a publisher with no experience and no, and he hired um, this guy John Farrer who had who had been a very well-known editor and who was a little bit on the rocks yeah he, he hired him as his as his cover as his you know front in a way yeah and kind of gives him a bit of legitimacy yeah there. right yeah. and they they bumbled along publishing anything they could get their hands on and then eventually they had some success with literary books and that's and then when he brought Bob in, Bob FSG Drew, yeah. gelled into becoming a very hot publisher. And I remember Phyllis Grant, who was a commercial publisher, very, very distinguished one, said to me once, in the 70s, FSG was bar none the hottest house in the business. It just hmm. published one exciting new writer after another. You know, Susan Sontag, John McPhee, Tom Wolfe, Joan Didion. Michael Arlen, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. It was mm -hmm. just, you know. Plus the big ones like Brodsky and, and Seamus Heaney. And they came a little later. Did they? But yeah. yeah. Okay. Roth, but Philip Roth. Roth. So there, there was a real sense of intellectual excitement and, and sexiness and cool, too. Mm -hmm. They, were, they mm -hmm. weren't just, you know, intellectual stars. They, they also had star power. You know, they were commercial. And Drew is like, you call them chalk and cheese. Giroux was, you know, Giroux would wear three-piece suits. He was a closeted guy, very old-fashioned, distinguished, scholarly, sort of an old maid. And Roger was a coxman, you know, so that, that's chalk and cheese right there, you know. <laughs> uh, and, and Giroux was really, a, he loved the writers, and he was very alive to writing. Roger was more of the showman. Yeah. So they kind of needed each other. That's that's the secret of their success. They didn't like each other particularly, but they needed each other, and they knew how to use each other productively. You talk about the excitement of seeing a book coming coming into being, like, like birthing it. Is that what you live for? It certainly has been 
a hugely uh, rewarding part of what I've done uh, in my work. Why my is that? Is it because you, you can? It's a tangible result of an idea because coming all into the of a world sudden or? something that didn't exist before exists. It's like yeah. having a child or something. Yeah. You know, the world has changed. And yet today, with these conglomerates, they don't treat these books as children. They they treat them as commodities. Well, I think that they have to do that. They have people. They have editors. If they if they're well run, like Random House, which I think is a well run, they have they know that their editors need to do that, and they let the editors do that. For the you know they're 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 interested in caring for the authors that otherwise they'll they'll go out of business. But yes, it's a it's a big big business, and you know I would say my job has changed over the years too. In that, you know I'm I'm not ideally um, positioned now to take on young writers. I'm an old, older person. I'm running the company, other people. So my job is more to kind of try to foster the right atmosphere for for them and to mm -hmm. encourage And what do, what do they do? Is, they, is, it like, is it like being a coach? Is it like being it's like a partly, supporter? Yeah, as, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and I mean, they come, t when they want to buy something, they come here and we talk about it. And, you know, I, I give them a little Socratic, you know, dialogue sometimes. My feeling is if you have an editor, you trust the editor. If that doesn't pan out, then you do something about it. But you can't second guess them no. every minute or, or they'll lose their sense of agency. So you have to pick, you know, it's like picking a book. You pick an editor and you, you stay with them. Yeah. Until you can't anymore. Or until sometimes they go. Who's the best editor you've ever worked with? Well, I worked with I've worked with Bob Gottlieb as an author. He was my, we published his memoirs and stuff. I think he was an incredibly good editor, very responsive to all sorts of different kinds of books. He would be one. Many of the editors here are really great. Pat Strawn was an early editor here. She was incredibly good. We're still publishing a lot of her authors. And again, um, we're talking about her eye. For, yeah, for yeah, what? her sensibility. Yeah. yeah. But an editor is not just, it's not just the sensibility as Stanley Unlund's. It's what they do with the text and then what they do with the, with the work in, yeah. in the world. Yeah, like they, they talk to the writer and they say, have you thought about this? As opposed to, you know, rewriting. Yeah, since the answer is not to rewrite the book, it's to get the author to rewrite the book. Because they'll always do it better than you could. Because it's their book. And in fact, you've said the better the book is, the less it needs an editor. Although, yes, and I, I, I think I believe that. But I also think that even great, great writers appreciate uh, someone asking them pertinent questions. Yeah. I mean, one of the greatest writers I've worked with is Marilyn Robinson, and her books come in really <laughs> letter perfect. But once in a while, I've asked her a question about to, to try to clarify something, and she's made a few changes, not many. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. When, you, when you've got a great writer, how do you edit a great writer? You well, know, it's, but, but again, you're, you're there to they're all they different. stimulate questions. They're all different. And, you know, and when someone's written a 600-page novel, there are bound to be things in it that could be different. They may not end up being changed. You once uh, remarked that the basic books was profitable, but the scale wasn't right. And, and that that's what's wrong with conglomerate publishing. You remember saying that? That's the what? Uh, you said that basic books, I think they were making like a 12% profit. Uh-huh. And... Uh, that's a very high profit. Yeah. 
but apparently the scale wasn't right. That's and and they were they were bought out, I guess. Uh, or, I don't I don't remember the context of my saying that. Okay. So what's your question? Well, my question is, you know, what's wrong with publishing right now? Oh. Or, or or is there anything wrong with it? I think what's wrong with publishing right now is what's wrong with the culture because it's publishing it doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's a response. It's a responsive business. It's, it's responding to the demands of readers, and so we're in a culture that where reading and writing are fundamental to playing on your uh, device. But everything's short attention span. Yeah. So, so yeah. to actually sit and read a book is is an act of defiance or of you know going against the grain of what of everyday life. It's, it's also it's also it seems to me anyway for me more of an effort than it used to be. Well, yes, because there's so many distractions. Well, I that's suppose, what, that's uh, yeah, exactly. So publishing has to lure people into finding ways to be. You know, Franzen wrote a book, a, a book of essays called "How to Be Alone," and it was about just this. You know, and I think um, that's one thing. But of course, publishers are chasing the buck, and they 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 want to do things that will bring immediate response, uh, get people to buy things. So it's it's a kind of I mean it's always been that way, but I think that the culture is just more fragmented and frazzled than it used to be. And of course, we have the politics we have, which are very very disturbing for a lot of people. And what's that got to do with book publishing? It has everything to do with it. I really do think so. Okay, like yeah. what? Well, I think if you're distracted and depressed... Don't you read to escape that? Maybe. Some people... I mean, the two biggest books our company published this year so far are Fire and Fury and the James Comey book. It may be good for a certain kind of publishing. It's just not good for people's esprit. Yeah. And does that affect the writers and the writing? In I the, think it in does affect the writers. And I just, I think, you know, Sonny Mehta last year said that Trump had taken all the air out of the publishing business, and I kind of agreed with him that people are distracted and they're 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 watching the news all the time. They think yeah. something's going to happen immediately, which of course it isn't. But everyone's worried and. Yeah, that's why they're watching. It's it's riveting because you're scared he's going to blow up the world. Yeah, it's riveting, but it's and it's depressing and it's yeah. exhausting and yeah. it's you know it's just feeding his beast all the time. It's just yeah. Do you wish you had published Rupi Kaur? What's that? She's this young Canadian phenomenon that's pu that uh, published a book called Milk and Honey Poetry. Oh, it sold uh, uh, one point five million copies. I haven't read it. Um, I've glanced at it. My daughter thinks it's crap. I think yeah. it's drivel. But then, yeah. I, I, I might be being misogynist here. Yeah, I, kind of snow. Sorry, it's a kind of poetry that doesn't really fit with our approach to <laughs> it's poetry. It's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> but I, you know, I haven't read it, so I can't. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. But I, I think that we need to be very broad in what we. Uh, what we look at, what we think about. Yeah, we can't just be, you know, caviar. No, no. And some people, uh, per, you know, defend this this kind of they call it Instagram poetry, or uh, that it's expressing uh, confessional truths to young women. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of that kind of stuff that's happening and not just in poetry a lot you know there's a huge we're going through a huge cultural sea change and a lot of the criteria that had made sense when I was growing up criteria for publishing a book or yeah criteria, criteria for, for greatness. criteria for publishing a book criteria for greatness I don't think it's really probably that different but criteria for what is interesting to people is those criteria are different. And we, as publishers, we have to be aware of that and we have to work with that. Does that mean dumbing down? I don't think it means dumbing down. I think, but I think it makes means 
making shrewd, shrewd choices. I mean, if, I think if you look at the l- books we publish today, they're just as ambitious as what we've always published. But they're, they're coming from many different places, uh, more different cultures than they used to be. And sometimes they start from scratch. I mean, you can't assume a common culture the way the way you could. Yeah. You could, but our, or our common culture is different. So all those things, factors that we have to take, in, take into a, account mm-hmm. every day in deciding what, what we're doing. And that's why it's important for us to have someone like Mitzi come, who's you know 25 years younger than I am, yeah. who has different experience, different skill sets, different attitudes, and the you know publishing is about is an actuarial profession. It's not you know in other words, it's about the lifespan, the lifespan of the readers, and the readers are different now than they were mm-hmm. even ten years ago. Yeah. Those things we have to we have to take into account all the time. I, I think one of the publications who's been most successful in doing that is the New Yorker. You know, if you look at the New Yorker today compared to twenty years ago, it's a totally different. Um, I, I I miss certain things about the old New Yorker, but but the is average, it more gossipy now? It's more f- journalistic. Uh, it's all. It was always. It might be more gossipy. I don't know. I think that the average age of the New Yorker subscriber is quite young compared to other venerable publications, and that's a sign of success. And they've still got a huge circulation. Yeah, so they're huge. they're, they're hanging on to it. Yeah, something. they're hanging on to it. That, they? Yeah, yeah, and they've they've made that transition to a new, and that's what we have to do if we want to be relevant, if we want to be read. Just if we could drill down a little bit on that, what do you think they've done that we... That, that I think that they have, they're writing about things that people in their 30s and 40s care about. So they've tapped into yeah. something. Yeah. yeah. Just winding down here, you, you, it's quite clear that book reviews and their number and quality has, has declined, and yet Amazon reviews are you know, now prevalent. I was listening to an interesting pod, a British podcast the other day, and they were saying that you don't want to dismiss these Amazon reviews. There, if you read if you read them in total, you get a pretty interesting yeah. idea of the book. I mean, I haven't followed this closely, but it seems to me I have an impression that they're not all genuine. You mean they're 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 promoted by the publisher? Sometimes authors will get their friends to write things, and, they, and that, that really disturbs me. That's yeah. very, because uh, that's not a review. No, yeah. no, it's, it's a blurb. Yeah, it's a blurb, exactly. I also had an experience where someone wrote uh, a critique of one of my translations on the page, and they were wrong. And so I wrote a thing saying, no, this is blah, blah, blah. But it's still up there as, you know, yes. that's the thing. It's it not, comes up at the top, too, probably. I don't know. To, I, just, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't care that much about it. But yeah. the fact is, uh, it's a lot of hot air sometimes. Yeah. So, but you do have to pay attention. I mean, you can get a general impression of what most people think of, of a book by reading the review. That doesn't necessarily mean they're right, but uh, it's better than nothing. Yeah. yeah. But I don't look at reviews when I buy a book on Amazon, do you? I will read the, the New York Times, the New Yorker, the yeah. uh, Guardian, uh-huh. but I won't, uh, no, I won't read the Amazon. I mean, I usually when I go to buy the book, I, buy, I know I want it, so yeah. I don't read the reviews. Yeah. So. Other book buyers may have a different approach. If you could comment on the fact that retailers can return unsold books, which is a mammoth problem, it's approaching 50% in well, some cases. Is that still... Returns are much less of a problem um, than they used to be because so many books are bought online and you, you can't return those. Okay, okay, that's and, interesting. Or, and e-books Not through is, booksellers? No. Yeah, I what's the percentage, I, do you know? Or maybe it's through 
e-books. Uh, uh, anyway, it used to be, uh, as you say, a 50% return. Thing. But, you know, nobody talks about returns in our business anymore the way they used to. They used to say returns are killing our business. Yeah. It's, it's just, when a book really sells, you have a, uh, historically a very low return rate because they're always trying to catch up with demand, basically. There aren't enough outlets to take books now, so that, you know, getting someone to take 20 copies of a book is very hard to do. And there's, and you can re re replenish much faster. So returns are less of a, to me anyway, I, I don't spend a lot of time worrying about returns. Just uh, winding down here, as I say, keeping insights in circulation and this is what, I guess, may drive you or publishers past, uh, as opposed to just a way of making money. If you uh, want to make money, publishing is really not the best <laughs> way of doing it. I mean, you have to have other reasons to want to be a publisher. Well, there has to be some sort of altruistic... Some sort of or excitement, that you're excited by... Mm. By ideas, working. I guess. Yeah, by ideas, by artistic expression by the, you know, the figure of the writer, by the sexiness of this kind of thing. Maybe publishing isn't as sexy as it used to be. It's not quite... It's not know, movie making. It's not show business mm. quite the way it used to be. Yeah. But, I, but there's still thousands of kids every year that want to be in publishing because, it's, because they've spent all their college reading books and they, they see... You know, they've met authors, they've been to readings, they... Well, there's some substance behind it, too. That's what I find, yeah, compared to, so, compared to yes, movies. And, and if you actually go off by yourself and read a book, it's a very rewarding experience. Mm -hmm. and they, uh, so, publishing isn't dead, it's just moved over into, you know, it's not quite at the red-hot center the way... Uh, maybe it never was, but it's less at the red-hot center so. Yeah, and I'm not sure if you said this or I picked this up somewhere, but books are where creativity begins mm -hmm. at the head of the river. Huh? No, that isn't something I've heard before. But I, I think that a book is the only way of presenting a long of a, a serious argument. You know. Yeah. Uh, so it's it is the head of the river in that sense. It's it's. There's no other way to explain a complicated idea than, than in a book. And books have never been replaced as objects. I think, and actually, one thing that happened in the last 10 years is everyone thought e -book, electronic books were going to replace books, but that hasn't happened. Books no, are alive like the reverse. and yeah. People like books. They like, yeah. having, they like their usability, their efficiency, their beauty, their... There's they like being able to underline stuff. Yeah, they like, and, and they like looking at a shelf and seeing their life. Yeah, uh, and they like showing them off to people. There are many reasons why, and they're beautiful. Yeah, and they, they smell really good, are. and they yeah, you know, they're part of their their accessories that are very meaningful to people. Mm -hmm. They are who you are. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I, you know, I was really into the books as a kid, and I'm still into them. Thanks very much for uh, taking the time to meet with me. It's great to meet you. I've been speaking with Jonathan Galassi, who is the president and publisher of FSG now and into the foreseeable future. <laughs>